on World News Tonight. New reigns. Malaysia's political strife comes to an end with the appointment of the nation's newest leader. Ukraine bombarded. Russia continues to escalate its attacks on Ukraine, succeeding in taking down essential energy centers. New wave? Once the COVID epicenter now experiences a repeat despite zero COVID policies in place. And the merry market. Germany's oldest Christmas market opens its doors to kick off Christmas. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. In a relieving end to the political unrest within Malaysia, the country's opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim was appointed Prime Minister, the Sultan's Palace said, and was sworn in today. A general election on Saturday ended in an unprecedented hung parliament, with neither of two main alliances, one led by Anwar and the other by ex-Premier Mudi and Yassin, immediately able to secure enough seats in parliament to form a government. Anwar's appointment caps a three-decade-long journey from heir apparent to a prisoner convicted of sodomy to long-time opposition leader. The 75-year-old has time and again been denied the premiership despite getting within striking distance over the years. He was Deputy Prime Minister in the 1990s and the official Prime Minister in waiting in 2018. In between, he spent nearly a decade in jail for sodomy and corruption in what he says were politically motivated charges aimed at ending his career. Russia has unleashed a large-scale barrage of attacks against Ukraine, disabling the country's energy system amid freezing temperatures in the region. Meanwhile, the EU Parliament had asked member states to support Russia being officially recognized as a state sponsor of terrorism. Russia bombarded Ukraine with around 70 cruise missiles on Wednesday, knocking out power and water supply in many parts of the country, as well as in neighboring Moldova. Ukraine's capital Kyiv, as well as the western city of Lviv, were among multiple targets of the latest strike. Authorities say that at least six people were killed and over 30 others were wounded nationwide. They added that some 50 of those missiles were shut down. Then Russia proved it true to the whole world, launching 67 missiles at our infrastructure, at our energy, at regular civilians. The result is tragic. There is a big number of wounded. There are people dead. The Ukrainian president also highlighted that Moscow should be isolated from international society and held accountable for its latest actions. He also explained that around 10 million people across the country were left without power and heat. To this end, Ukrainian authorities say they have opened up emergency shelters offering food and heating in different parts of the country. The latest strikes appear to be part of the Kremlin's strategy of targeting Ukraine's critical infrastructure to knock out power and other supplies as the country braces for plunging winter temperatures. Meanwhile, as Moscow launched fresh attacks on Ukraine, the European Parliament designated Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism on Wednesday. The latest move is largely symbolic, as the EU currently cannot officially designate states as sponsors of terrorism. However, the Parliament is pushing the regional bloc and its member states to devise a proper legal framework that would allow Russia to be added to such a list. On an update on the COVID hiatus, an alarming uptick in infections have been detected as China reported the highest number of daily COVID-19 cases since the start of the pandemic nearly three years ago. Long lines for COVID tests, shuttered stores and schools and restaurants limited to takeaway service. Beijing has reimposed restrictions to deal with a resurgence in COVID-19 cases, causing frustration among residents. Everybody thinks this back and forth is really inconvenient. Some of my friends' businesses have gone bankrupt, some have lost their jobs. We really hope this pandemic ends soon. It's not just the capital that's dealing with an outbreak. Zhengzhou in China's central east and Shenyang in the north will conduct mass testing in the coming days, as well as restrict movement. Chinese authorities say the measures are necessary to protect lives after average daily cases doubled in one week. The epidemic situation in many provinces has been widespread with multiple transmission chains. Some provinces are facing the most severe and complex situation in the past three years. 
While China's case numbers are low by global standards, authorities maintain the need for a, quote, dynamic zero-COVID policy. The country slightly relaxed travel and quarantine restrictions almost two weeks ago, but local officials are still using strict lockdowns to curb infections in some areas. The latest outbreaks have sparked concern among investors as they cast doubts on China's economic reopening. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the triple denic of RSV, the flu and COVID is pushing some hospitals over the edge as the U.S. faces a shortage of pediatric beds, medical staff and even some medications. In Buffalo, some store shelves normally filled with children's Tylenol are empty. Pharmacists say a spot shortage of the drug in Canada triggered by mounting cases of RSV is spilling over the border. Johnson & Johnson, the maker of Tylenol, says there is no overall shortage in the U.S., telling we are experiencing high consumer demand and are doing everything we can to make sure people have access to the products they need. Still, the FDA currently lists amoxicillin as being in short supply, and it all comes as the healthcare industry braces for a potential triple-demic this winter. RSV, flu, and COVID colliding, adding to the strain on the system an increasingly dire staffing shortage. More than half a million people in the healthcare and social services industries quit their positions in September. King Charles and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa are making an effort to create a stronger foundation for lasting relations with the introduction of a new health and science package between the two nations. On the second day of President Cyril Ramaphosa's state visit to London, Britain and South Africa have announced a new health and science partnership. Ramaphosa met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at 10 Downing Street, where the two leaders joined a UK-South Africa business forum to discuss trade and investment. South Africa is Britain's biggest trading partner in Africa. South Africa and the UK, obviously very strong partners, allies, friends, and we share so many of the same objectives, notably transitioning to clean energy whilst creating jobs and opportunity for our citizens. Ramaphosa's state visit marks the first such official guest hosted by Britain's King Charles, who has rolled out the traditional pomp and ceremony to welcome him. Earlier on Wednesday, Ramaphosa met with Charles's brother, Prince Edward, and toured the Royal Botanic Gardens, which will work with South Africa's National Biodiversity Institute on preserving South Africa's plant diversity. The two countries also announced new research collaborations in climate change, vaccine manufacturing, and genome sequencing, which plays a key role in detecting COVID-19 variants. Meanwhile, terror returns to the streets of Jerusalem as two blasts initiated by Palestinian terror militant group Hamas, killing a 16-year-old boy and injuring over a dozen more. This comes as Israel's newly re-elected Prime Minister Netanyahu pushes to form a new far-right government. In the middle of rush hour, a bomb exploded at a bus stop in Jerusalem, followed by a second blast nearby less than an hour later. At least one person was killed and dozens injured. It's the first time the city's been bombed since 2016. This is a type of attack that we haven't seen for many years. Two blasts in a row. We cannot determine whether it's one attacker or two. The Palestinian Hamas militant group said the bombings were a result of Israeli repression, calling them heroic, but did not claim responsibility. The blasts follow a wave of gun and knife attacks in Israel this year, which has killed dozens of Israelis. In response, Israeli forces stepped up raids in the West Bank, with 122 Palestinians killed by Israeli forces so far. The UN warns 2022 is set to be the West Bank's bloodiest year in almost two decades. Visiting the site of the attack, ultra-nationalist lawmaker Itamar Bengvir called for further crackdowns. I say clearly, we need to back up our soldiers and our policemen, returning to targeted killings of Palestinian militants, ruling the state of Israel, deterring terrorism, and making terrorists pay. As former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu brokers a right-wing coalition government, Bengvir could become internal security minister with oversight of the police force. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. In the UK, the Supreme Court ruled that Scotland does not have the power to hold any referendum on independence without the consent of the British government. The judgment is a setback for the Scottish government's campaign to break away from the United Kingdom. The Scottish government's aspirations to leave the United Kingdom has taken a blow. As the UK Supreme Court has ruled that Edinburgh does not have the power to hold an independence referendum without London's approval. Scotland originally planned to hold a referendum in October, posing a simple question to its people, should Scotland be an independent country? But in light of the ruling, it now says that the UK's next general election will serve as a de facto referendum. We must and we will find another democratic, lawful and constitutional means by which the Scottish people can express their will. In my view, that can only be an election. The next national election scheduled for Scotland is, of course, the UK general election, making that both the first and the most obvious opportunity to seek what I described back in June as a de facto referendum. London welcomed the ruling, claiming the question of Scotland's independence was decided in 2014, when the majority of people voted to remain in the UK. And I think that the people of Scotland want us to be working on fixing the major challenges that we collectively face, whether that's the economy, supporting the NHS, or indeed supporting Ukraine. Now is the time for politicians to work together, and that's what this government will do. In the last referendum, 55% of voters cast ballots to remain in the UK. But now the Scottish nationalists argue that Brexit has changed the game and that leaving the UK might allow it to rejoin the European Union as an independent nation. It has been a tournament of upsets in Qatar. Just when we were getting over with the Saudi Arabia win over Argentina, Japan fans in Tokyo were left in disbelief as their side pulled off one of the World Cup's greatest shocks, beating four-time champions Germany. The Blue Samurai came from behind to clinch victory with two second-half goals in the Group E opener. Four-time champion Germany had looked to be cruising to a routine victory via LK Gwyndogan's first-half penalty, but paid a fatal price for profligacy in front of goal. Japan had shown almost nothing in attack until a series of second-half substitutions injected some energy into their first competitive fixture against Germany. Ritsu Doan equalized in the 75th minute before Takuma Asano showed lovely control and smashed the winner in from a tight angle, causing an explosion of joy among the Japan bent and head-shaking among German fans used to watching both players ply their trade in the Bundesliga. The shocking upset is not the only thing being discussed as players and fans continue to find means to urge equality and non-discriminatory practices despite FIFA's strict prevention of them. Since being banned at the World Cup, these anti-hate armbands have only become more popular than ever. The Dutch company that makes them says they've completely sold out after shipping thousands of them in the past two weeks. The One Love armbands have been in the global spotlight since FIFA threatened several European teams with yellow cards if they wore them. The bands symbolize diversity and inclusion. Homosexuality is illegal in host country Qatar. But teams are still finding ways to protest. Germany's team was photographed with their hands covering their mouths ahead of their game against Japan on Wednesday. England captain Harry Kane opted for a different band, one that says no discrimination on their opening game against Iran. His teammates took a knee ahead of kickoff. Meanwhile, Iran's players declined to sing their national anthem in a sign of support for mass protests and a violent state crackdown back home. Danish FA CEO Jacob Jensen went as far as to say FIFA was harming soccer with the ban. I think that's deeply disappointing. It's regrettable. And I think this is something that FIFA uh, needs to take a, a long uh, and intense look at in order to change in the future. Space travel may soon be accessible to not just the able-bodied, as the world's first para-astronaut was named by the European Space Agency. The new category of trainees aimed to allow for more inclusivity in humankind's pursuit of the stars. John McFall has been named the world's first para-astronaut. He's a British Paralympic sprinter and doctor who lost his leg in a biking accident when he was 19. Now he's part of a new generation of recruits picked by the European Space Agency for astronaut training. I felt compelled to try and help ITSA uh, answer this question, can we get someone with a physical disability uh, to do meaningful work in space? 
The ESA posted openings last year for the role of astronaut with a disability and received 257 applications. Candidates were to be fully capable of passing its usual stringent psychological, cognitive tests, and only prevented from becoming astronauts due to the constraints of existing hardware in light of their disability. Diversity it comes in many different ways. David Parker is the ESA's Director of Human and Robotic Exploration. McFall will take part in a feasibility study with the ESA to determine the changes in hardware needed for people with disabilities to take part in future missions. I think the message that I would give uh, to future generations is that science is for everyone and space travel, hopefully, can be for everyone. FTX, the distressed cryptocurrency exchange that has filed for bankruptcy, has fallen into even deeper waters, with attorneys in charge of the case revealing that it was run as a personal fiefdom for the former CEO. FTX was run as a personal fiefdom of former boss Sam Bankman-Fried. That was according to attorneys for the collapsed crypto exchange on Tuesday. The comments came as the firm faced its first bankruptcy hearing at a court in Wilmington, Delaware. Speaking there, a lawyer said FTX now planned to sell off healthy business units, but he said it was the subject of cyber attacks and had substantial missing assets. He said $300 million had been spent on real estate such as homes and vacation properties for senior staff. FTX, now under new boss John Ray, has also accused its former chief of seeking to undermine bankruptcy proceedings and trying to move assets overseas. Bankman Freed didn't immediately reply when approached for comment. In a separate filing this week, consultants said FTX had a cash balance of $1.24 billion as of Sunday. That was substantially higher than previously thought. However, Reuters has reported that Bankman Freed secretly used $10 billion of customer money to prop up his trading business. At least $1 billion of that appears to have vanished. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea's defense chief urged China to play a constructive role in addressing North Korean threats and encouraged the regime to return to dialogue. The comments were made on the sidelines of an annual regional security meeting in Cambodia. A vigil was held for six people who were killed in the shooting at Walmart. The gunman has been identified as a 31-year-old. The attack comes just days after another mass shooting. Protests at Foxconn's flagship iPhone plant in China turned violent as hundreds of workers clashed and hit out at the security personnel in white hazmat suits. Hyundai Motor America is having the best year in its history in the U.S. market, but the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act could put the brakes on that success. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with displays of a number of traditional Christmas markets opening their gates to let the punters start on the mulled wine and bratwurst as the festive season officially got underway in parts of Germany. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.